you're out there on the water and it's one of those days where you're catching fish that are just bigger than expected. You've been doing well, but then a really, really big fish takes your fly. You can feel from the moment it hits that this is a seriously, seriously big trout. You start to get nervous. You instantly think about your knots. Did you tie them right? Are they going to hold? You worry about the hook bending out. You worry about getting this fish to the net before it gets away, before one of the dozens of things that can go wrong goes wrong. The difference between success and failure in this moment comes down to knowing how to handle the once or twice a year holy crap fish. And that's what we'll talk about on today's episode of Untangled. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant. We've got we've got quite a lot to talk through on today's show. I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. We're gonna be chatting all about fish in murky water, fly selection for wild versus stocked fish, dry dropper rigs, and how to land some really big fish. And for anybody who is watching the podcast, uh, the Pony Express got a flat tire <laughs> because the SD cards did not quite make it to me yet here in Wyoming. So I'm running on the uh, laptop camera once again, but never fear. We are going to be back up and running with the real camera set up hopefully next week. And speaking of next week, Alex is going to be here in studio. That's right. He is trekking all the way from Utah up here to Wyoming. He's going to be here. We're going to be talking all about fly rod selection. So you're definitely not going to want to be missing out on that episode. We're going to be talking like action, length, weight, and uses for all different kinds of fly rods. So it's definitely something you're going to want to stick around uh, for and listen to next week. And speaking of listening to things, sticking around for things, I am stoked by the amount of questions that we've received from everybody uh, in response to last week's episode about uh, if you submit questions, you're entered to win one uh, fly tying mega kit from us here at VFC. Well, we are closing in on that magical number, the hundredth question submitted. So keep the questions coming and we will announce the winner on next week's show. Now, before we get started, I did get a couple of really uh, quick questions a couple of weeks ago that I want to go through just Knock these out of the park. First off, David from Colorado writes in and says, a few weeks ago, I used my Ventures gear and caught some beautiful rainbows. How can I get the pictures to you? Well, David, you can tag us on social media. We love to see pics. So this goes for anybody. If you've got pics, please tag us. We love to see that stuff. Uh, or you can email the photos to us at live real life. That's uh, live real, R-E-E-L, life at Ventures Flyco. Dot com. I'll put the email address in the podcast description. And then the next question, real quick, uh, comes to us from Eric from New Hampshire. He says, will the new Venture Fly Vice uh, be available to purchase separately? Yes, it is. Our Flysmith Vice uh, is available to purchase separately, and there is a link in the podcast description. So that knocks out sort of our housekeeping stuff. Let's dive right into the meat of the show. Riley from Utah writes in and says, how do you fish in murky water on the Provo River? Well, first off, Riley, don't go bothering to fish on the Provo, okay? Uh, no, Provo's a great little spot. I know there are some land access issues going on on the Provo right now, uh, so tip my hat to the folks who are trying to make sure that there's still public access to the Provo. It's an important fishery for the area, and It'd be a real shame to see that all tied up in private land for too long. So hopefully that can get cleared up. But anyways, uh, this is a really good question, Riley, and really apropos for this time of year, right? I'm, I'm going to tackle this for any river because there's a method to fishing murky water regardless of where you're at. So this will work on the Provo, but it should work on other streams that everybody listening to the show uh, you, you guys should be able to apply this to your local rivers. Uh, this would involve learning where fish go when the water gets off color and then knowing what kind of bugs to throw in this situation. So I'm going to tackle the first part 
uh, of that, and then we'll move on to the next part here. Where do the fish go when the water gets high and off color? Well, usually, okay, and there's a lot of usuallys in this because it doesn't always hold true. Your river might be different, all right? But this is kind of our rule of thumb that we work with in fly fishing. When the water gets murky, it's usually higher than normal. And if that's the case, then the fish tend to get uh, pushed to a few different places. They tend to get pushed to the sides of the river, deeper pools, or behind any obstacles in the river, like rocks and logs, where there's a big pocket. Because the water rises, there's more water. That pocket increases in size a little bit, so the fish are going to hang out there because that's providing a big break from that really tough rush of current that's coming by everywhere else. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was actually out fishing here in Wyoming, and the river I was on with my buddy Joe was high. It was a couple feet higher than normal. It was still clear to tell water, but it was really high. And we just could not find the fish. And it wasn't until we switched to fishing like 10 feet closer into the bank that we started getting into the fish because they'd been pushed that far out of their lives. They'd been pushed 10 whole feet. Excuse me. They'd been pushed 10 whole feet closer to the bank than where they normally were. So you will see that with higher water. That's pretty common to see those fish get pushed to the bank like that. If the water is murky, your best bet in this situation for catching some fish is going to be bigger nymphs that have a lot of movement. We're talking squirmy wormies, mop flies, prince nymphs, even dead drifting streamers is a really good choice. Murky water, again, this usually means that there's some kind of flooding going on. So smaller food items and fish are going to get tossed around a lot. You want to try to imitate that motion as much as possible when you're drifting your bugs through the places where the water is calm enough for trout to hold. So dead drifting a streamer, but giving it a lot of kind of like dazed and confused action is a really good tactic because the water rises and it's pushing these fish and if they get plucked out of their lies. They're going to tumble downstream. They might hit a rock and get stunned or just not behave correctly. And then when they get pushed into the pockets of calmer water, they're going to look like, you know, <laughs> they're going to look like they just woke up uh, after a long weekend of not fishing or not catching, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so you want to try to imitate that with your streamers, especially even some of your nymphs. You can kind of twitch them or, uh, or just kind of give a, a really subtle swing to some of them because it'll kind of imitate how, uh, how battered around they've been, uh, in that faster, higher water. And last bit, uh, here before we move on, make sure you're being safe. If that water gets is high and it's off color, uh, it, it's really easy to get swept away in higher water, a lot easier than you'd think. I know a few guys who have been, uh, who've had some really close calls with that. So definitely make sure you're being safe as you're running around and doing this. We wouldn't want anything bad to happen to anybody. So practice practice safety as, as best you can. Hopefully that uh, answers your question, Riley. If you need any clarification, please don't hesitate to reach out to us here. Next question comes to us. Trent from Utah writes in and says, Hey, Spencer, thank you for doing this podcast. It has been a game changer for me, and I've learned a ton from you. I unexpectedly lost my dad a few years back, a couple days after my wedding, and unfortunately wasn't done learning everything I needed to learn from him, especially his fishing wisdom. That man could catch fish out of a storm drain, like you say. We had big plans when I got back from my honeymoon to go fish the high-altitude lakes in central Utah with the big brookies you've alluded to in a couple of your episodes, and I'm hoping to make that trip this summer. I always feel closest to him while I'm out of the water, so thank you for helping me get back out there and not be completely lost. My question for you is what's the best way to land a fish once you've got it on? I can't tell you how many fish I've lost after hooking them. What's the strategies you use to hook them properly, work them in close enough, and net them? I appreciate the help. Wow, Trent. Thanks a ton, man. Thank you so much. That feedback, that feedback means a ton to me, really. I am, I'm stoked that you're getting out there in the water. And that's so, so awful to hear about your dad. I'm so sorry about that. 
really, really stoked that you guys were able to spend some time fishing together, though. I did a lot of that with my dad, and I know how uh, meaningful that can be. So thank you for being willing to share that and reaching out to your question. That's just wonderful. Thank you very much, Trent. Now, on to your question. Let's see if I can help you out here, okay? Landing and playing fish, there's as much of an art (laughs) to this as anything else in the sport. Some folks might disagree with that. Uh, By art, I mean it's something that you are going to learn the intricacies of the more and more you do it. So the fact that you have gone and failed as much as you have, and I'm you know failed in that you've lost fish, right? The fact that you've gone and done that, that's actually awesome because you've learned a lot of what not to do. And I'm not saying that, you know, tongue in cheek like we do all the time. Like, oh, I learned what not to do, right? I learned where not to shoot an elk if you want to get it. I learned how to not catch a fish. Well, you know, being glib all aside, you actually are learning from it if you step back and say, okay, what did I do wrong there? Why did that fish escape? Now, you might not know enough to know the answers to those questions, but that reflection process can teach you quite a bit. Uh, that's what I mean about this being an art, right? That being said, there are a few things that you can do that you can you can know going into landing these fish that's going to help you out. That would be you want to keep tension on the line, put the fish on the reel when you can, be aware of what your rod angle is, and then Lastly, remember that you are not fighting the fish in the traditional sense of the word, right? I'm going to explain all of these in greater detail, so let's jump right into those. First off, the big problem I see a lot of beginners make when I've been guiding or just when I've been teaching other folks to fish is that they do not keep enough tension on the fly line. If you let the tension go at all, you are probably going to lose that fish. So you don't want slack line when you're fighting that fish. That's why, and I harp on this with folks that I'm guiding all the time, I don't want to see any slack line. Okay, you keep the line pinched between your finger and the cork grip at all times so that when you go to set the hook, there's always going to be a tight line between you and that fish. If you go to set the hook and you're trying to hold all your slack line in your left hand, you set the hook, there's still so much play in that that you're going to miss fish. Or if you hook them, you're not going to hook them well, and they're going to get away. So make sure that you keep tension on that line at all times. That is the number one way to make sure that you do not lose a fish when you're fighting it, in my experience. And I know a few other guides who would agree with that as well. That's why a lot of guides tell you, keep tip up, keep tip up, because keeping that tip up usually means that you're keeping tension on the fly line. That's what we're trying to uh, to drill into a lot of folks is you need to keep tension on the fly line. I hope I've said that enough. <laughs> All right. But it really is important. Yeah. It's like when I tell my students at school, like, make sure you're putting your commas uh, between items in a series. You've got to do it. Right. I say that all the time. And what do they not do? Put commas between their items in a series. So same concept, just trying to make sure you don't forget it. Second, if the fish is going, like you hook this fish and it just takes off, man, like, uh, trying to think of something that takes off like me after the wing truck. There's a wing food truck up here in Northern Wyoming, by the way, heaven sent. I'll tell you that right now. If uh, a wing it is listening, uh, I I'd love for you guys and Coke to join the sponsorship of this podcast. All right. <laughs> uh, seriously though, if that fish just takes off, your reel has way more stopping power than your hands or your fingers do. And remember, this is what a reel is built for. A reel is built to provide resistance to the fish as it tries to scamper away from you. And it's partly why they cost so much dang money because a good drag costs a little bit to engineer and then to construct and make sure that it's not going to fail on you. So if that fish is running, put it on the reel, let the reel do the hard work of tiring the fish out while you focus on keeping tension on the line and getting your rod angle right. And that's the next thing we're going to jump into. But don't be afraid. I've seen a lot of folks who, it's it's like there's two extremes. Either I get clients who really want to just put the fish on the reel immediately and start reeling. They're very used to traditional conventional fishing in that sense. Or I get a lot of folks who don't want to put it on the reel at all. So 
you need to kind of find that happy medium. When the fish says it's ready to go on the reel, put that fish on the reel. Now, rod angle, all right? This is something that there's, there's a lot of schools of thought on rod angle. And I spent a good chunk of time thinking this through and then picking the brains of some other folks I know uh, to, to find some good information on rod angle to give you. You've probably watched anglers who turn their rods like side to side while they're fighting fish. And I've found that's pretty prevalent among the Euro nymphing anglers. Uh, I see them do it or I see them talk about it a lot more than others. I see Lance Egan and Devin Olson, for example, talk about that a lot. And it's great information. I'm really, really glad they share that. Some of us might look at that though and think, well, that's overkill. Do you really need to turn your rod like that? Well, what they're doing is they're actually utilizing the lower sections, like the butt and midsection of the rod, to help guide the fish towards a net, right? What I mean by that is if you keep your rod tip like super high and you try to use that rod tip to turn the fish where you need it to go, it's really only the tip of your rod that's exerting a whole lot of pressure on the fish. That rod tip doesn't have anywhere near the mass or the strength that your butt section does. When you can engage the butt section, you're using the power of both your reel and the stiffer part of your rod to guide the fish around in the water and get it to the net. With that in mind, if you can keep your rod at like a 45 degree angle to the fish, not super high, not a 90, kind of a 45, you're utilizing more of that butt section of the rod but you're still allowing the tip section to do what it should do, which is absorbing the shocks and run of an angry fish. Now, personally, I don't turn my rod completely sideways when fighting fish, but I do like to have the bend in my rod facing the opposite direction that the fish is going. For example, if the fish is going upstream, the bend in your rod should be facing downstream. And I'll kind of, I'll kind of take it a little bit to the side, like a 45 degree angle to the side as well uh this utilizes all the power in your fly rod plus your reel just like we talked about so with rod angle pay attention to the angle of your rod try to keep it at about a 45 degree angle to the fish and get the bend of your rod facing the opposite direction that the fish is going this combination of using your reel and rod angle is going to tie your fish out quickly especially those bigger fish And it's a pretty solid way to make sure that you're exerting pressure in a way that's not going to endanger your knots or your, uh, or or anything else that could go wrong. If you're fighting a fish this way, you're spreading that tension out evenly. So as long as you tied a good knot, you shouldn't have to worry about it coming undone. Now, of course, that's always easier said than done, right? It'd be great if all our knots were perfect right out of the gate. They rarely are, but that's, That's why it's fishing, right? We go out, we make mistakes, and we learn. Now, to finish up answering your question here, Trent, remember, you're not fighting the fish so much as you are guiding it to your net. I've talked about that a couple of times, but I I really want you guys to think of it that way. You're trying to get the fish to swim towards your net so that you can lift its head up and slip the net underneath it. If you just try and yank uh, and horse the fish directly back to you, you're going to snap your line or pop the fish free of its hook. That's something that I see a lot of folks who fish conventionally do. They come over to fly fishing and they just want to kind of manhandle the fish in. It doesn't really work like that. Uh, The way that I've heard it described that makes the most sense to me is you want to guide the fish towards either bank first, whichever bank is easier for you to get to. And then once you've got the fish towards the slower current because usually the current's a lot slower towards the bank then you bring it towards where you're standing in the water if you think of it as guiding the fish to the net instead of fighting the fish i think you're going to have a better chance of not having that fish pop off so those are the four things that i would say are going to help you uh land big fish to land any fish really but especially the big fish if you can kind of play them like that remember you're not fighting them Keep the rod angle right. Experiment with what different side pressure does. And you'll see when you turn that rod uh, to the side a little bit and you get that 45-degree angle and your your rod is bent opposite the way that the fish is going, 
you're going to feel that fish is having a tough time running on you. And you're going to start real, you're going to start uh, getting more fish in the net quicker, which is great for you. And it's great for the fish, right? We don't want to tire them out too much. So hopefully that answers your question, Trent. If you've got any other questions, please write in. And thanks again for taking the time to send that question. Really appreciate it. All right. Our next question, Ross from California writes in, says, is there a difference of the fly selection if the fish are native or wild compared to stocked? Should the fly choice be more junk than the standard midge nymph? Ross, that's actually a really interesting question. And the short answer is no. I've actually had a lot of stocked fish get really picky, like during midge hatches that have just been stocked in the river. Uh, the stalkers sometimes are obviously not as smart as wild fish, but there's still a fish, right? They're not going to just eat anything. You can't throw just anything out there at them. They're still picky. They're still discerning. They're still looking at things. And using their little fish brain to make big fish decisions, right? Uh, the exception to that would be like pellet flies that are tied to look just like uh, the food pellets that you can feed fish. Sometimes if you've been to hatchery or anything like that, uh, stockfish freaking love those things. <laughs> All right. If you live near a place where they stock a lot of trout, tie some pellet flies, go out there right after the stocking truck, you will clean up. I may or may not be speaking from personal experience, but hey, we can't all catch wild trout all the time, all right? Uh, anyways, uh, I actually uh, used to test out a lot of my new fly patterns on a stocked pond near my house in Utah back when I lived in Utah. It was really good to know if the fish liked them, and if the stocked fish liked the flies that I was tying, the wild fish almost always did. I I can't remember a time when the stalkers turned their nose up at a fly and the wild fish jumped all over. If the stalkers didn't like it, the wild fish usually didn't like it either. So they're they're a pretty good litmus test in that sense. Uh, there really is far less of a difference between stocked and wild fish than we sometimes would like to assume or like to imagine <laughs> that there is. Uh, we can get pretty, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, we can get a little uppity, I guess. That's the word I'll go with. We can get a little uppity as anglers. We tend to look down on stocked fish. But the truth is, almost all these fish were stocked at some point. So, you know, we're we're, to, we're fishing for stalkers or remnants of stalkers, with very rare exception of the few places where native fish have been, and we haven't managed to screw those ones up yet. So... Uh, good question, though. Gets us thinking a little bit about stocked ponds, which I think I'm going to be fishing a lot of those because runoff is finally showing up here. And I think most of our rivers are going to be blown out here in Wyoming for the next little bit anyways. So great question, Ross. Thank you very much. And just like that, we are at the end of the show. So well, we have one more question. So one more question. We're not quite at the end. So don't weep yet. Don't go into an uncontrollable rage that you don't get to hear my dulcet tones coming at you for another week. We've still got a few more minutes together. It'll be okay, I promise. And uh, in case you didn't catch that was sarcasm, I don't think that I have dulcet tones, but I do enjoy the chance of go, uh, the chance to sit down on the podcast every week. And I, I do miss it sometimes when... Uh, when it's been a while between episodes, we do we do them every Wednesday, but sometimes I'll do a couple back to back. Just you know, that's how the schedule tends to work out uh, for me sometimes, and then it feels kind of weird. I'm like, oh, I haven't sat down and chatted with folks in a minute. Anyways, I'll quit my yammering, and I'm going to answer Josh from Maryland. He wrote in and said, "When dry dropper fishing, do you tie the dry fly to a tag end and the dropper on the point, or do you tie the dropper to the bend of the dry fly hook?" And why? Thanks for putting on the show. I listen every week. Hey, Josh, I listen every week too. <laughs> We've got something in common here. No, I'm kidding. That was a great question. The dry dropper rig is actually my preferred method of rigging up. I was out, yo, this past weekend and uh, got a fish dry dropper. And first couple of casts, I had a fish 
it's just it it's the way that makes sense to me and my fishing style it just works for me that's why i love it so much and i'm really glad to hear that you are working on dry droppers yourself but what i really love is that you asked the why behind this question i think a lot of us and this is something that i think somebody asked me once like what separates like really good anglers from mediocre ones. Not that I'm a good angler, but I've had the opportunity to fish with a lot of folks who are just outstanding, better than I'll ever be. And I think one of the things that separates the good anglers from the meh anglers is the good anglers are the folks who want to know the why and they relentlessly pursue understanding the why behind all the things that we do. So that's the perfect kind of mindset to have because you're going to be able to understand these things better. And once you understand it, that's when things start to become intuitive out there on the water. That's when you pick a fly just because like you, you know, it's going to work. And if somebody asked you why you're like, well, I just, I just know it's going to work. Or you can look at a piece of water and say, I just, I know there's a fish there. Uh, that when you you're able to start intuiting things like that once you start to understand the why behind these questions so uh, i'll quit my pontificating i'll get back to your question josh but i was very pleased to see that from you when i set up a dry dropper rig i always tie the dropper off the bend of the dry fly hook i just attach my dry fly to my leader like normal i don't mess around with tags uh or tag ends or anything like that Uh, I guess you could tie like a surgeon's knot with one short and one long tag and tie a dry on the short tag and a nymph on the long tag. But that just seems like a really big tangle waiting to happen to me. I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I rig up my dry droppers the way that I do because tying the dry fly to your leader like normal allows for the most natural drift possible. And that's what you want, right? You want a good natural drift of your dry fly and a good natural drift of your nymph. And the whole point of your dry dropper rig anyways is to kind of utilize the best of both worlds. You want to be able to present a dry and nymph at the same time. Even though your dry fly is working as an indicator and it's doing that for you too, you still want to catch fish on it if they want that dry fly. So if you tie your dropper through the eye of the dry fly hook, I've seen some folks rig up a dry dropper rig that way. I think that's just going to mess with the drift of the dry fly. It's just not going to drift normal. You're going to have extra weight pulling kind of the head of that dry fly down. It's just not going to look quite right. Now, if you tie the dropper off the bend of the hook, the nice thing is the dry fly is going to drift normal, but you can switch out that nymph super easy. You can shorten it. You can add length to it if you need to. It's just a really convenient way to fish it. Um, and it, it's the way that I was taught to do it, so it's the way that I still do it. Uh, it's just a really slick way to put it all together. So hopefully that answers your question there, Josh. We also have a blog post on this subject that I'm going to go ahead and link in the podcast description as well. Now, we really are uh, at the end of the show for this week. So thanks to everybody who tunes in and listens to these shows. Uh, it's wonderful to get the Uh, listenership and the participation that we do and remember we are getting really really close to that uh, 100th question and picking the winner for the fly tying mega kit from us here at vfc so make sure you're still submitting your questions we will announce the winner on episode 21 that's also when alex is going to be here we're going to be talking everything fly rods we're talking action length weight what you what you want to use different rods for we're just going to knock it all out and have a great time doing it so until next week everybody tight lines <laughs>